Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to season two of the Nakabi Diaries podcast, a platform dedicated to sharing the stories of the women behind the veil. This season, we will be speaking to more Muslim women from all walks of life as we continue to discuss their deep and intimate reasons for wearing the Nakab, the Nakabi Diaries, our experiences, our perspectives, our voices. I'm your host, Samar, and thank you for listening. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, sister. How are you? Wa alaikum salam wa wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, doing well. How about you? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, sister, for joining us today on the Nakabi Diary. Sister, could you please introduce yourself for the listeners and tell us a little bit about what you do, inshallah? My name is Zainab bin Tunis. I am a Canadian Muslim woman. Uh, I've been on the internet for a really long time. Uh, so originally my handle was Anonymous. Um, this was when I was a teenager, so don't hold it against me. Uh, and then I just ended up becoming known um, as the Salafi Feminist. That was my handle on Facebook for quite really? a while. Was that you? That was me, yes. Do you know, I've been looking for you. Yes, I have taken a hiatus. Um, just kinda... I, was lo- I used to follow <laughs> your page on Facebook. Wallahi, and I used to love your content and I was I thought to myself one like it was some months ago I was thinking wait a minute I was following the fellow people and this <laughs> all this time where has she gone I went to her Facebook and I was looking and looking I was thinking she'd be great I, w- I really want to interview her subhanallah look how it's like <laughs> <Charmy. laughs> subhanallah wow yeah so I've uh, I've loved Facebook and Twitter for the um for the foreseeable future. I just had a lot of life stuff to focus on and work on. So I just hang out on Instagram now, um, Zainab bin Tunis. Uh, and I still write for muslimmatters.org, which I helped co-found back when I was like 16. Uh, okay. And I have since written for Al Jumu'ah magazine, Sisters magazine, um, Islam online slash about Islam. Uh, and obviously for my own blog that I'd had up for a while, it's still around, but it's pretty much a graveyard there. So I'm pretty much just post now. I write my articles for Muslim Matters. I have my podcast with Muslim Matters uh, and I post to Instagram. So that's kind of the rundown of it. Allah Mubarak, mashallah. I'm, I'm just happy that I've, mashallah, Allah's blessed me with this interview. And literally I was looking to interview you, sister. And subhanAllah, it's just worked <laughs> out in such a, wow. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, um, so sister, can you tell us a little bit about your Islamic background for us and then introduce us to how did you get to be wearing the niqab, inshallah? Yeah, so my family is ethnically Desi. Um, so we are South African Gujaratis. My parents were both born in South Africa. My mom was raised there. My dad moved to Canada when he was quite young with his family. Uh, I grew up here in Canada pretty much all my life. Um, excluding the first three years, which were spent in Medina, Saudi Arabia, because my dad was studying there. He is an imam. Uh, so he graduated from there. We moved back home to Canada. And that's where I lived my entire childhood and adolescence. Um, I lived overseas for a few years. I was in Egypt and Kuwait for a while. And then I was in Malaysia. And then I came back home to Canada. So mm-hmm. I'm back in my hometown, alhamdulillah. Uh, I don't have like any formal Islamic studies qualifications. I've got a diploma in the history of female Islamic scholarship uh, through Ahmed Akram Nadwi. I've got a diploma in Islamic studies through uh, Eris Institute with Sheikh Hassan Rajab. And the rest of it is really just informal learning along the way. I read a lot. Um, but yeah, I'm basically just a rando on the internet who reads a lot. <laughs> So are those institutions that you mentioned, are they online? Are they courses that other sisters could join? Yes, absolutely. So with Sheikh Mohammed Akram Nadwi, uh, if you look up uh, a Salem Institute online, I believe he still offers that course, the History of Female Islamic Scholarship. And for Eris Institute, just uh, go online, look up Eris Institute, so A-R-E-E-S, Institute okay. of Sheikh Hassan Rajab. Uh, I did my diploma in person with him in Malaysia, but I believe that he actually offers a bachelor's degree uh, online. So if anybody's interested in that, highly recommend that. Sheikh Hassan is pretty awesome, mashallah. And uh, Sheikh Akram Nadwi is just absolutely amazing. Tabarak Rahman. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Great. So um, how did you come to be wearing the niqab? Like what age was you and where, like what kind of stage was you? I take it you've been practicing most of your life, right? So Yeah, alhamdulillah. So growing up, my mom was actually the only niqabi in our city. So we literally live on an island. 
Um, when we were first here, it was a really small Muslim community. My family helped establish the masjid here, the first masjid here, alhamdulillah. Um, so that gives you an idea of just how tiny the community was. Um, and then as we, I grew older, like obviously I watched her wearing it and I really wanted to wear it. Um, from a fairly young age, like around 14, 15, but my parents were both very adamant that like I had to wait up, I had to wait, grow up a bit, become more mature, do my research, understand that this was like a serious commitment um, before I took it on. So I actually ended up only putting on niqab when I was about 17 years old. Okay. And the, the, it wasn't just seeing my mom wear it, although obviously that played a role, but it was also just the story of how the ayat of hijab came to be. Mm -hmm. um, which I find absolutely amazing and encouraging. When the ayats came down and they were recited to the believing woman, specifically the woman of the Ansar, um, they immediately acted on that ayat. They didn't kind of stand around waiting for a man to tell them, okay, well, this is how you cover and you should cover this and you should cover that and body, body, blah. But they immediately understood the meanings of Allah's command and they ripped like the sashes as the, as the tafsir goes, they ripped the sashes around their waist to cover their to cover their heads and I believe in some narrations their faces as well and there were just so many believing women from the Sahabiyat who covered their face who wore naqab including the mothers of the believers and so for me that was just amazing and really empowering like this is an example of women who out of love for Allah and his messenger out of ze zealousness to obey Allah's command they tried to fulfill those ayat in the most perfect way like unfortunately today we have a lot of people who do the opposite where they try to explain away the hijab where they try to make excuses for why it's not necessary where they try to essentially go for the bare minimum instead of trying to achieve ihsan in worshiping allah mm -hmm. and for me wearing naqab is an act of worship first and foremost it is fulfilling the command of allah so for me that was my primary motivation and then i also liked the idea i mean i was a teenager so i was you know, kind of into the whole like rebelliousness factor, like, you know, stand out. I mean, as it was, I was an abaya, I was already, you know, a Muslim woman in Canada with a small Muslim uh, population. So, you know, there's a bit of that, um, or there was. Now it's just, you know, second nature to me, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. No, I definitely agree with you. And I think that it's a shame that, you know, sometimes Muslims themselves have lost, lost the meaning of the hijab as well because even recently there was a sister who is recently well I don't know how long ago but she's she said that she was previously a hijabi mm -hmm. and she was basically trying to say that you know the niqab is something that men use to oppress Muslim women and I'll just you know I said well like where did you get that from you know where, it really where is that narrative me. coming from because it doesn't come yeah. from Islam Yep. Now, unfortunately, there's obviously the issue of how, um, unfortunately, a lot of Muslim men have used hijab and niqab as a way to, I don't want to say like to control women, but to exert control over women and to turn it from something that is done as an act of ibadah into something that is done for the sake of men, whether it's to quote unquote, you know, protect men or whether it's to to satisfy like a twisted kind of cultural idea of jealousy um, that's not based in a healthy sense of ghira, but it's just very, you know, mm. uh, ego-based, very culturally fixated on concepts of honor that don't quite exist in the deen. So I understand that, you know, people have reactions to, to those ideas and concepts, but obviously the correct response is not to dismiss hijab and naqab now is like, oh, this is all just cultural and this is all just men trying to control women. It's, we have to be a lot more educated about it. We have to be able to identify the difference between what is fulfilling Allah's command and having a sincere intention in doing so versus somebody, a human, whether it's male or female, trying to force it on you for their own personal reasons. Um, and that's a discussion that we really need to have within the Muslim community and that needs to be had with intelligence because unfortunately a lot of people just react in really... Um, it is a very reactionary manner that's not very intelligent, unfortunately. Yeah, subhanAllah, definitely. So, um, you know, you mentioned you started wearing the niqab when you were 17, but you wanted to wear it before that. So for mm -hmm. you, when you started wearing it at the age of 17, would you say that you found it easy because you'd wanted to wear it for such a long time? And even if you did found, find it easy, um, was it something that 
you still had to, you still felt you had to adjust to on a practical level because obviously like you're covering your face and like you know how did you kind of navigate the practicalities going outside maybe if the weather was hot or eating outside for example and what was you doing at the time was you studying so emotionally it was super easy for me alhamdulillah I just it felt pretty natural actually but yeah practically uh, I remember thinking like first or second day I was eating french fries outside and I smeared ketchup all over my makeup because I forgot <laughs> my face was covered wow. um and then I learned the hard way that eating powdered sugar donuts is a really bad idea <laughs> with a black niqab um so I had a couple of hiccups like that uh but outside of that alhamdulillah it was it was pretty easy it was just mostly just a matter of trying to figure out what my niqab style was um and what you know suited me the best what I found most comfortable that kind of thing uh, outside of that, let's see, I had just graduated high school, um, but I also got married like literally right out of high school. So I ended up moving to Egypt with my ex-husband um, pretty much immediately. Actually, no, no, I take that back. Um, I wore it for about a year before I left home mm -hmm. and it was fairly easy. I mean, I did experience some like Islamophobic screaming and yelling, whatever, but I already saw that before with my mom. No. Um, and so it like obviously it irritated me but it didn't traumatize me it, mm. it didn't upset me in the sense that I was like emotional and crying I just get like really angry and ticked off and yell back at them <laughs> um which usually freak them out because they never expect you to respond they think that they can just insult you and that you don't speak English um so I still maintain that policy today when people say stupid things to me I will turn around and like dish it right back at them uh and that makes me feel better <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, sister. So um you 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 when you was obviously you was a child, your mum was wearing it and you said that you noticed that she faced kind of comments. How did your mum usually react to those? My mom is a lot more of a patient person than mm -hmm. I am. Uh so she just ignore it pretty okay. much. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And um, personally, like, have you, would you say you've kind of ex um, faced any, ex any extreme abuse apart from like comments and things like that? Let's see. Uh, yeah, for the most part, it's, it's pretty okay, alhamdulillah. But I have definitely had uh, some issues, uh, especially when the whole niqab ban issue was coming up with Quebec um here in Canada where they're trying to ban niqab mm -hmm. and so I have been working for the last four years uh in retail uh, right. of all things so I was working in chocolate shops primarily and a couple like and like lush and stuff like that um and for the most part things were pretty good I did however end up having issues where yeah, this one time a customer came in, looked at me and was like, in Quebec, they're trying to ban people like you and they should do that here. And then she turned around and refused to talk to me. So I had a coworker who um, who went and dealt with her. My manager was absolutely amazing, mashallah, back then. And he was, you know, really ready to like jump to my defense anytime he saw somebody look at me funny. Um, what else? There, yeah, the, before I started working actually, this was just after I moved back home to Canada. My daughter was really young. She was like four years old mm -hmm. and we were walking to the beach and this middle-aged white woman who was dressed, you know, very professionally in like a skirt suit kind of outfit. She walks by, like deliberately shoves me and starts screaming at me about my niqab and mm -hmm. I was livid. Um, and of course, like my daughter started crying because here's like this random stranger just like screaming and cursing and all of that. So if my daughter wasn't there, I would have probably like punched in their face. Um, but, you know, I had a four year old to deal with. So I told her off. I was like, oh, my God, like, aren't you ashamed of yourself? There's like a child here and you're making her mm. cry. And she's like, well, then you shouldn't be dressed like that. Anyways, I just turned around and went home. Um, mm. I have been threatened on the bus a few times because I would bus to work. Uh, one guy claimed to have knives in his bag. So that was the whole thing. Wow. Uh, there have been a few sketchy incidents, but mm. by and large, everyday life is pretty normal. Alhamdulillah. So when, when those things happened, were you, apart from the time with your daughter, obviously, were you usually by yourself? Yeah, I was usually by myself, like at work or on commute to or from work. Mm. It's amazing. These people, they really are cowards because they know how to pick people out, like, you know, when they're by themselves. Yep, and then they, yep, you know, then sure. they'll turn around and say that, you know, talk about oppression, but who's doing the oppressing then? Do you know what I mean? Exactly. 
Subhanallah. So you mentioned that you've, um, you know, you travel, you've traveled to and from different countries, so you've done a fair bit of traveling, but um, how was the, your experience wearing the niqab when you was doing, you know, travels and stuff like that? How's your experience been? Traveling has been pretty simple for me. Alhamdulillah, I've always kept my niqab on while traveling. Um, I've always had the wonderful random airport selection. I've been detained for a few hours, but that wasn't related to niqab so much as my family. My dad's been in the news a few times, so that kind of, you know, carries over. Um, but yeah, no issues with niqab in and of itself while traveling, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And um, are, you, are you currently working now as well, apart from doing your writing? Uh, I'm currently studying, actually. So okay. work is kind of part-time in between semesters kind of thing. Um, and still boring, basic retail, but alhamdulillah, you know. Um, yeah, like I'd say, again, overall, like between school and work, it's it's fairly tame um and the main thing is really being willing to answer people's questions when they're genuinely curious and they're not just being racist jerks uh so yeah i i mean i would say you just have to be resilient and you also have to be willing to shrug things off um but then you should also be willing to like call out racist nonsense when you of see course. it like i've had some really annoying customers who like who would say racist things to me like literally as I'm serving them and I would just again dish it right back at them mm. so yes yeah, so what about with your studying are you is it is that something that's like is it um on campus or is it online so it was on campus prior to COVID uh nice. this last academic school year was all online and my summer class that I'm doing now is also online mm -hmm. uh it is a public college so I'm doing a program called community family and child services so it's community services which is you know a step towards social work mm -hmm. but it's the reason that I ended up taking that was because it's very very applicable to dawah work and I've been involved in grassroots dawah like pretty much my entire life I've been raised in it and mm -hmm. it's what I'm still very active in doing now uh, like I still teach madrasa with my family we still teach classes that kind of thing uh, and so it's really important for me to get the the academic qualifications and certification behind that work um, yeah so it has been on campus and uh, just this last year was uh, online because of COVID. And then inshallah, I think they're anticipating going back on campus for the upcoming uh, upcoming school year. Inshallah. So um, when you're on campus, would you say like, how's your interaction with other students? And um, would you describe the Naqab as being a barrier to your education in any way? Not a barrier at all. I really think it's like what you make it out to be. Mm -hmm. I show up. I engage in class very vocally, very actively. I make a point of, you know, expressing disagreement when there are things to disagree with. Um, I'm not shy about my opinions. So, I mean, I think everybody's pretty much figured out that a piece of cloth over my face doesn't hide my voice or silence mm -hmm. me or any of that. I've had some pretty good uh classmate experiences, to be honest, but I also keep my head down after, like outside of class, I'm I just want to go back home or to go to Marissa yeah. or work or whatever. So I'm not sticking around socializing with everyone very much, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it has not been a barrier to my education in any way, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, I'm really spoiled. My my family all lives like five minutes away from me. My parents, my brothers, my grandmother, my aunt. Uh, so alhamdulillah, I have a lot of family support. Like my dad and my husband will take my daughter to and from school. Uh, my dad will take her uh to like his place or madrasa or whatever it is like when I was working on weekends she would still stay the weekend with my parents um and I would come by after work and uh, and hang out and sleep over and whatever so alhamdulillah I have a lot of family support alhamdulillah that's great mashallah alhamdulillah so and um, would you would you say sister um like in your community and um, the Muslim community in general and obviously you've traveled to different countries as well What's your perspective on um, how sisters who wear the niqab get treated compared to sisters who wear the hijab? Do you think there's a difference? I would say that there is, yeah, there's definitely the stereotype of the judgmental niqabi and then people will be judgmental towards you based on that, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, but honestly, again, I feel like it really depends on who you surround yourself with and how you deal with people. Mm -hmm. um, it's become normative enough in my community to think that nobody really cares 
or and if they do I just don't know about it because I don't hang out with those people yeah uh, I see more of these attitudes online um with like snide comments and you know people saying stuff about naqabis but in person it's it's really not as huge a deal uh overseas in like Egypt and Kuwait each country had like its own interesting dynamics with regards to like hijab and naqab um that are pretty complex and kind of odd so yeah it's like in Kuwait it was like debatable whether you're wearing it for culture or for religion and if you're wearing a certain way that it had certain like cultural implications um in Egypt it was also really weird because dudes just tend to be super duper pervy there even and especially when you're in naqab so they will like try to stare you down or cat call you and it's it's really bizarre but um Wow. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Malaysia was definitely, Malaysia is my favorite country in the world, to be honest, mashallah, Allah, Allah, Allah. Um, Everybody's super chill, super respectful. Everyone's just awesome, mashallah. I don't think I've had a single negative experience in Malaysia. So props to Malaysia. Alhamdulillah. I hear a lot of good things about Malaysia, to be honest, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. That's great. So, yeah, um, sister, um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your writing. How did you get into writing? And um, you did say you're the co founder of um, Muslim Matters. Yes, so I essentially have always had opinions and been a little too vocal about them. Uh, and so I just wrote them all the time. <laughs> um, I started off as a blogger uh, and then connected with a few other like-minded Muslim bloggers and we all got together and co-founded MuslimMatters.org, which mashallah, you know, um, blossomed into a pretty huge platform. Um, I was retired from them for a few years and I came back a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, for me, it's like writing is just part of who I am. So I've always done it. I don't have any formal training in it whatsoever. I just, like I said, I read a lot and I write a lot. And uh, that's that's really it, to be honest. Alhamdulillah. So um, when you um, started it, obviously you said you ha- you've always had a lot of opinions. So was it just something you just thought, let me just make this platform that I can get my opinions out? Or was there any kind of specific aim that you had when you started it? I actually started off writing articles for a local uh, Muslim newspaper in Vancouver back when I lived there. Mm -hmm. So that was my first experience where I was like writing for a community platform. And I shared a lot of my articles just on my blog. And then as I like really got immersed in the Muslim blogosphere, I was just like, yeah, there's all these Muslims hanging out on the internet. Let me join them basically. And so that's that's how it started really. And then having things to say, like I said, I've always been involved in grassroots dawah and activism and being involved in that kind of community work. I found a lot of similar minded and experienced people online like Muslims. And so it became a really valuable opportunity to learn and to share and to have um, some really great discussions together. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, and, and can I ask you about the Salafi feminist? Because obviously I was following you on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So how, how was like, you know, how do you, because I just thought that was amazing. I really, really loved the content that you were sharing there, mashallah. So like, obviously I'm assuming it is com- kind, kind of coming from the same place, but obviously it's a different platform as well at the same time. So would you kind of give them the similar content? Um, would you say the content from Salafi Feminist was similar to what you would put out on Muslim Matters as well, or were they kind of distinctly different? Um, a little bit of both, I guess. So with Muslim Matters, I just covered a lot of different issues, wide range of issues. But I did become, like when I kind of came up with the Salafi Feminist moniker, it came about because I became very heavily invested in Muslim women's issues um, Mm -hmm. and all the issues that we're struggling with. And I continue to be very invested in those topics and those issues because of my personal experience, because of the experiences of so many Muslim women who have reached out to me and talked to me and shared with me. And we don't have very strong advocates, unfortunately. There are too many people who are unfortunately um, either too shy or too afraid or too uh, worried about how others will speak to them or perceive them or react to them. Um, And for better or for worse, I care very little about other people's opinions about me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I didn't really have any sense of fear in terms of like, oh, if I say this, what's going to happen? I mean, I did have people harass me. I had hate mail constantly. I had people like publicly attack me. I had stalkers. Really? Because of the Salafi feminists? Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, I had people like going to my husband, my father all the time, telling them to tell me to shut up. Uh, it was a whole thing. Um, and uh, it was a good run. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, like, I'd say I probably made a few mistakes here and there. But by and large, like I felt and still feel very strongly about the topic of of just being an advocate for Muslim women and standing up for ourselves and not being shy to call out our problems and our issues, you know? So yeah, it's it's work that really needs to be done. Yeah, it really is important. Because I mean, I remember like the things that used to bring up there, that's the, I think that's the first time that I used to see somebody really kind of taking these things head on. And it's not only that, but you would, you know, give references from the Quran and the Sunnah, which kind of backed it up. Whereas you know often when it came to like women's issues a lot of you know from other muslims maybe it's always got this kind of um i don't know like kind of a western feminist kind of edge to it maybe. yeah unfortunately like the progressive liberal academic types have really done a number in hijacking the muslim discourse about muslim women muslim women's issues and that's something that i'm actually really focused on right now um, doing a bit more research on a lot of like progressive Muslim academics and how they have done a horrible job just like dismantling understanding, basic understanding of how Islamic sciences work, how Islamic scholarship works and putting a lot of doubt in the hearts of Muslim women in terms of like, oh, can we really find and get our rights from Islam mm -hmm. when you know it's all patriarchy, it's all this, it's all that. Now, obviously, I'm the first person to say like, yeah, misogyny is real and it's it poisons our ummah. But at the same time, the proggy academic course is not the way to go. Like leaving, going further apart from Allah, trying to find ways to abandon the words of Allah, trying to find ways to you know, create a new Islam is, it's really not it. So again, it's a, it's like a two pronged battle that we have to fight. We have to fight all the issues that we have within the Muslim community. And then we have like these other people trying to just dismantle our deen. So definitely, definitely agree with that. Cause um, the, the other day I was just kind of going over, um, looking at some Islamic history and things like that. And I was watching a, a documentary about Sheikh Faisal, actually, um, not Sheikh Faisal, uh, King Faisal um, from, you know, the king, one of the yeah, past kings yeah. of Saudi Arabia. And, and it was talking about how he reintroduced education for females in Saudi. Yeah. And it's something I didn't, I didn't have any knowledge about. I don't really know much about Saudi and stuff anyways, in general. It's actually a fascinating story because uh, it was him and his wife who was mm -hmm. a, a Turkish noblewoman or a yes. princess, I believe. Um, and they were very passionate about women's education. And I think that's an amazing thing. Like that's an example of Things that we don't hear about, right? That we're yes, not talking exactly. about. But I mean, then Saudi as a country generally does get labeled as a place where, um, you know, is kind of not progressive when it comes to women's rights. But if it's had this kind of history where they, I don't know how long this period was for that w women were prevented from education, because it, you just think to yourself, like, as you know, technically, you know, it, as in, in the eyes of the, Muslim, of the world in general, even whether it's Muslim or non-Muslim, Saudi Arabia is the home of Islam. OK, and mm -hmm. that's the place where everybody kind of looks to that. Oh, that anything, whatever they're doing, that's what Islam is. So yeah. to, to say to, to knowing that they've had this in the culture, that there was a period where girls were not allowed to be educated. You know, it's quite kind of enlightening because obviously this is where some of these ideas um, of uh, you know misogyny and you know lack of female rights and things like that is going to come from because they've had the period or I mean where did that come in like why did they have I mean why did I they ever have that in the culture that, you, that girls mind. weren't allowed to education yeah I think it's important to keep in mind the cultural context though because like back then education in general was not very well formalized to begin with hmm. for boys or girls and most girls were privately taught how to read and write and whatever kind of domestic things um and like the concept of a public school system itself had not been completely formalized hmm. so it's not like oh the boys had this amazing education system and girls didn't it was just that like an option existed for boys that didn't exist for girls at that time and then it was introduced for girls um and it's really important to note actually that despite um, the bad rap that Saudi has in many ways that it actually deserves because like they're screwed up in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to education for women in not just in Saudi, but in the surrounding like Khadiji Gulf countries, uh, women are extremely highly educated. Like they've yes. got like multiple degrees. 
they have great careers and stuff too. Um, I think every Saudi woman I've met has had like bare minimum, like a master's degree in at least one topic. Yeah. Um, I've had an amazing Quran teacher, uh, Sheikh Sumaya, who she had her Islamic studies degree. Uh, she was a hafiza. Um, she taught Quran and she had, she was living in Canada for a while uh, and then in Malaysia, pursuing her master's and her PhD in secular studies. So, and she is not, you know, an anomaly by any means. Like they are extremely well educated. Definitely. I mean, I can, I can, uh, I can agree with you because I've had similar experience here. Whenever I've met women from those countries, they're always more educated than everybody else that I know. Like, it's something that's that's why I was so shocked to like, you know, notice that in the documentary. But um, and I think unfortunately, like the truth of what like you know the situation, how things are is not what people seem to recognize and I don't know like maybe it's partly to do with the feminists themselves who come from some of these countries they kind of propagate this idea that the women in those countries are having really the hardest lives and the hardest time and they're you know they're, yeah they you've got people oppressed. like Munal Tahawi who is notorious for just like making up BS and all kinds of nonsense like I've read so many books you know allegedly by women who lived in Saudi and who you know just perpetuate this idea that it's a dank dark place that has nothing I'm like y'all don't understand how spoiled Saudi women are exactly they are sitting there with like drivers and chauffeurs and nannies and often living the lap of luxury and I mean again don't get me wrong there's a lot of issues there there are a lot of challenges um but they're not unique in the sense that they have certain issues I mean there are plenty of other Muslim countries with different issues there are secular countries with way worse issues exactly. in many many ways so it's it's not like oh this misogyny is unique to Saudi or to certain types of Muslim countries I'm like no it exists everywhere it just manifests in different forms it's essentially it's jahiliya and this is something that I um that Sheikh Akram Nadwi uh articulates really well that whenever you see the oppression of women and injustice against women it is simply jahiliya whether or not it's justified with deen or not and of course islam and allah never allow uh, oppression like allah has said he's uh he's forbidden oppression for himself and he has forbidden it for us so it doesn't matter how many ayats or hadith somebody quotes the, if they are oppressing women it's oppression of women and that's haram Zulm is uh, oppression in this world will come as a darkness on the day of judgment mm -hmm. um, and those who twist the words of Allah and his messenger will be punished for it yes yeah, subhanAllah it's, and it's, it's so true like uh, just subhanAllah it's disappointing when you see um, you know these kind of things and I think part of the issue as well when um, you know just when it comes to Muslim women who are practicing especially um, you know when we want to speak up and you know kind of voice our opinions and things like that then you get the kind of sometimes people come with very I don't like to use words like extreme but you know they come up with kind of views like oh the woman's voice is older for example so you shouldn't like you know we shouldn't be talking like we shouldn't be talking publicly yeah yeah of and things. they of course like conveniently forget the fact that that's like it's either weak hadith or fabricated entirely so and like, you just no. I That's just don't really understand good. because in, if you look at Islamic history, that just wasn't the case, you know. So yep. where where are they where are they bringing that from? And then especially today, um, it's not practical as a Muslim woman to not talk, you know, like publicly. You need to do you you will need to do that sometimes, you know. And it's not like you're just talking for no reason. Like we have issues. Like I've been a single parent for like twelve years. So for me, mm -hmm. if I didn't, you know, if I was just going to sit in the house or just sit in the corner, kind of thinking, oh well, somebody needs to speak for me, then. I wouldn't get anywhere you know there's certain things that I need things that I need to do you know from on a practical level you need to speak up for yourself you need to you know put your point of view across so that people can be aware of you know what's going on of different issues that do exist that they might not be aware of because that's not what they're experiencing honestly there's just so much ignorance about Muslim women in Islamic history and female scholarship. And this is why I love Sheikh Akram's class so much because it literally shatters all these myths and ideas and stereotypes and like these, these attitudes that have been created in the Muslim community and, and passed off as Islamic and say like, oh, women should just stay at home. Oh, women, good Muslim women don't do this. Good Muslim women don't do that. And when we look to the Sahabiyat, when we look to the students of the companions, the female students, and we see the scholars, female scholars of the past, 
they were epic. They were amazing. They were out there fighting battles, doing business, mm -hmm. teaching hundreds and hundreds of male scholars, uh, Imam al-Bukhari and Imam al-Shafi'i. And, and so many of the amazing male scholars that we know of had female teachers. They would not have been who they were without those female teachers. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, like I said, it's just a lot of ignorance and then there's a lot of deliberate hiding of it too, or trying to say I like- I think oh, so, that's what, you know, it's, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I've been thinking recently about this and I thought like, you know, I, I understand that obviously as a Muslim woman, we have like, you know, we want to have our haya and all this kind of thing. But I was thinking like, it's obvious that somewhere in our history, it's been deliberately hidden you know the kind of roles that you know Muslim women were take like you know taking part in and playing, um you know in the in their communities in general because like you said so many Muslim scholars that like predominant scholars the name the big names that we know they're all men's names we don't really know big names of female scholars apart from that UK we can say Asha Radilah and then, you know the other um, yeah. mothers of the believers for example but after them like how many Muslim female scholars do we know of? The sad thing yeah, is we don't know so their names many. and why is that it shouldn't be like that yeah and this is why i highly recommend that anybody who's listening to this like please go out and get the book al muhadithat by sheikh muhammad akram nadwi you will discover so many amazing names so many amazing stories you'll find about umadar da sohra you will find out about um the uh the student of Aisha Radilana, whose name escapes me, which is kind of ironic. Um, <laughs> you'll find out about Aisha bin Talha, you'll find out about Sakina bin Hussein, you'll find out about Karim al Marwaziya, you'll find out about um, just so, so many amazing female scholars, Fatma Samar Qandiya. And when you discover like who they were and what they did and what high esteem they were held in, you're going to be pretty enraged that you never found out about these women before. Yeah, subhanAllah, because our, our, you know, we need to, we as women need to know about this and our daughters need to know about these things as well. I just think it's, yeah, and our sons as well, not even just our daughters, our sons too. Exactly, it's incredibly important for our men and women yeah. to know these stories, to understand what our history really is so that we can have a better, healthy, holistic idea of what our ummah is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's about having that balance, isn't it? I think like... I don't know it's just it's just so strange like when you think about this kind of stuff because I'm not saying that you know I know definitely there's a lot of pressure on women in society to perform like many roles for example and especially like even just being a mother itself you have a lot of roles that you play as a mother mm -hmm. um you know it's multifaceted and these days you know women have a lot of issues it seems with you know postnatal depression and other kinds of things where they find um you know aspects towards being a mother quite challenging and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested to really look into it and kind of find out like if this is something that has always been or it's something that is more I just like it's, it's more, more of like of our recent times and like yeah, the reasons why we're more. having these kind of issues now because it seems like more I don't like to say trend as such but it seems more of something normal to hear that a woman has suffered like postnatal depression after having a baby and things like that <laughs> You know, and where sometimes it could be very short lived and sometimes it could be quite for long periods. And, and and obviously there could be specific reasons why that's happened as well. But I wonder if in the past women also had this kind of issues. And if so, w was it ever discussed, you know, in different communities and how did the women deal with it? You know, and, you know, why did they, you know, how, why did they experience that basically? Do you know what I mean? Like, and were they as well? Because like, obviously a lot of these scholars, the um, females, they must have been mothers as well you know i assume they had children and things like that so how did they have their balance um, i think it's important to note is that modernity and colonialism and the uh, introduction of like the nuclear family unit and being isolated from extended family that's all had a really hard toll on women in particular Definitely. Um, in the past there was like the tribal structure there was mm -hmm. extended family support system women were not like single-handedly raising their children they had yeah. their mothers their sisters their aunts you know in-laws whoever it was they had an entire structure to rely upon and support them and you know the, even basic tasks like like cooking and cleaning were all um done community shared, yeah. were shared by others mm -hmm. and then you did have female scholars who, who were mothers then you had female scholars who never married and never had children mm -hmm. uh, and there's just such a diversity and that's something that we really lack right now we have like a very uh, monolithic idea like a Stepford wife kind of idea of what a muslim woman should be but that did not exist in the past because mm -hmm. 
again, there was such diversity. There were women who loved to study Quran, and then there were women who loved to study fiqh, and then there were women who specialized in hadith, and then there were women who, you know, had businesses, and then there were uh, women who had many children, and then there were women who had no children, who chose not to get married. Um, again, just so much diversity. Like, we don't have a single one model of what a good Muslim woman should be because there are so many different ways to be an amazing Muslim woman. Uh, and we're really lacking that understanding of, of healthy diversity in our communities today, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely. Because I, I've noticed like a, a bit, when a woman is single, especially, especially I think if she's never been married, like she's always pushed that she should be married, for example. Yes. And then obviously then you've got the situation where, for example, like, you know, somebody who's been married and then they get divorced that's like another stigma is upon the woman again. It doesn't seem to carry with the man, but for the woman, yeah. it's like, oh, well, you know, you're divorced basically. In, in so there's, there's all these kind of weird culture. things that exist in like, you know, Muslim cultures now, which isn't Islamic whatsoever. Yeah, and I say in certain cultures, it's more pronounced than others. Like with the DC is the stigma against divorce exists even for men, unfortunately, but it is like much, much worse for women. Um, but yeah, like there's just a lot of jahiliya. Some of it was picked up from colonialism, unfortunately. Some of it was just already ingrained within those cultures and it was brought back and mm. kind of made a part of the culture and religiously justified in some ways when it, it's not. Um, but yeah, the ignorance that exists that is just perpetuated over and over again is extremely unfortunate. This is why it's so important for us as Muslim women to pursue studying, to ask those hard questions and not to be satisfied with, oh, just this is the deen just listen to the sheikh and, and don't question don't argue no you should find out yeah. i mean obviously you don't want to like reject allah and his messenger but you also don't want to assume that the words of a random person are equivalent to what allah and his messenger have said cool. always ask for the this is what sheikh Hassan taught us what's the dalil find it ask the questions is it authentic is it not what was the context for it mm. you can't just like pull an ayah or hadith out of isolation and be like aha this means that you have to stay home. This means that you can't do this. This means you can't do that. What did the Sahabiyah do? What did the mothers of the believers do? How was it understood by the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu How was it um, dealt with by Rasulullah And this is why, again, so, so important for us to study and to learn. And there are amazing female scholars today that we can learn from. There's Sheikh Aisha was, was there's Dr. Haifa Yunus, there's uh, Sheikh Ashazia, uh, Ahmed, there is Dr. Rani Awad, there's Sheikh Dr. Tamara Gray, um, there's Sheikh Zainab Ansari, the Sheikh Aisha Prime. There's just so many amazing teachers. Sheikh Maryam Amir, um, just again, so many amazing teachers and I highly recommend anybody who's listening, please go find them. They're all available on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube. You can find their lectures, find these female scholars, learn from them, study from them, ask questions, always, always ask questions. Um, but obviously don't go to the extreme of like Amina Wadud or Kishali or Fatima Murnasi. Like those people are not scholars of Islam. Mm -hmm. They're academics yeah. who have a very specific progressive agenda um, and they outright deny Quran and Sunnah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you want to always make sure your grounding is within the Quran and Sunnah, that you are always mm -hmm. checking back is this pleasing to Allah? Is this obedience of Allah? Is this truly seeking to understand the deen as opposed to make excuses or justify one's own weaknesses or one's own frustrations? Definitely, subhanAllah. Really, I think, uh, inshallah, I'm going to get you to give me a list if that's okay, like of yeah, all absolutely. these names. And then um, we'll, what we'll do, we'll I, I, I'm creating a blog actually. So inshallah hopefully by the time this episode is released hopefully my blog will have been complete because I wanted to make a blog for the Nakabi Diaries oh nice we'll have like a page where like sisters can go and just look like for links to references to all these different you know female contemporary scholars as well as those of the past as well but I think especially the contemporary ones of today because it's really important because you know we hear you know like you like if you've talked about so many things here which is really important for us but um you know, we know these things must be out there, but it's just how do we get like access to them? And like you mentioned, there's certain people like, you know, that we shouldn't take from, you know what I mean? Like, so we, we don't want to become like confused and think that somebody's um, a scholar when they're of Islam, when they're actually just not, you know, because they happened, they said that they're Muslim, but you know, they're just academics, but not actually scholars of the religion itself. 
so that's mm-hmm. really important so inshallah if, if I can get that from you that'd be really great yeah absolutely just like a look ahead okay so um yes sister I don't want to keep you for too much longer so I'll just ask you the last uh, inshallah a few questions so you can mm-hmm. <laughs> be on with your day I'm sure you've got plenty of other things to do um so I wanted to ask you as well um have you met any um sisters who would like to wear the niqab in your community or otherwise um but they've been prevented from like family members or they um you know or maybe sisters who've been forced into wearing it have you come across anybody not like that? so much uh my local community online for sure mm-hmm. I think it's interesting because we've got two different extremes here we have those who are prevented from wearing niqab and who like face harassment from family and friends for it but then on the other hand you have those especially new converts Mm -hmm. who are pressured into it like almost right away really Um, and it's yeah and this is like definitely a thing um where they're told like oh yeah now you have to cover up and like they're they've barely taken their shahada they barely know how to pray and they're kind of pressured into this and it's very unfortunate like i've seen it so many times where a woman has converted and like literally within months she's in like full niqab and she barely has had time to understand like what is salah what is Mm. so hate what is you know just building up your basic sense of islamic identity and knowledge before being thrown into like the deep end with niqab and then obviously like their families are struggling to understand like just the fact they converted at all um and then you know they go through like the super zealous phase and then obviously that's not sustainable it's not healthy for them spiritually or emotionally uh and then a lot of them end up taking it off and then take off hijab entirely so that's Mm. a whole pattern unfortunately that i've seen that I discourage. Now, for myself, I consider niqab to be sunnah, not wajib. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that a lot of people forget. Like, it's okay to be like a part-time niqab. It's okay to transition slowly. It's okay to wear it and then decide, like, maybe it's not for you in your time or context or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it is really important to understand why we do it. It is important to prioritize it, not as something where it's, it's not like hiding you away from society and erasing your identity. And it's not about pleasing men or hiding you completely away from it. Like that's obviously an element of it is we are obviously hiding ourselves from the male gaze that does exist. What comes first and foremost, it is belief in Allah and worshiping Allah, doing it as an act of ibadah Mm -hmm. and having that grounding and having that foundation and just having a really balanced, healthy, holistic view of what it is and what it means. That's, what's really important to establish so that there is not undue emotional attachment given to it whereas like somebody will prioritize hijab or niqab over a salah five times a day yeah you know obviously like one is followed and the other is not um so yeah like we have a lot of unhealthy narratives and ideas about niqab and like wearing it or not wearing it unfortunately and that really needs to be uh, addressed and dealt with more Yes, yeah, subhanAllah, definitely. So um, what would you specifically advise sisters who are contemplating wearing the niqab at the moment? Um, and Always maybe they feel they don't have that your, much confidence. Yeah, check your intentions. Ask yourself why you're doing this. Don't be afraid to just like try it out a little bit. Do a test run. Um, don't be fanatical about it. But be strong as well. Like if you really want to do this, if you're convinced like, you know, this is an act of worship that you really want to do and you you're truly inclined to it like praise the haram make dua that allah strengthens you and don't care about other people's opinions their opinions do not pay your bills <laughs> so why do you care you know like really you really have to develop a thick skin i think it's just a valuable skill as a person but especially so as a muslim woman you have to learn to not care about other people's irrelevant opinions and you have to know how to stand up for yourself you need to be able to articulate yourself clearly. You need to be able to hold your ground. Don't like have a mental breakdown because somebody said something mean to you or looked at you funny. Mm-hmm. Like, like be strong, be strong. Like truly, like as a Muslim woman, we are meant to be strong. We are not like little delicate flowers to be trampled on. We are an ummah of strong women and we need to act like it. Definitely. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I agree with you completely. Mashallah. It's really important. Um, so to end the interview, I will ask you, what does the niqab mean to you? 
ibadah. It's an act of worship. It's something that I hope will give me, you know, like edge of brownie points on the day of judgment. I'll be asked about like all my sins and my screw ups. But then I'll also be told like, hey, you got a mountain of because you went and did that. So I'm like really inshallah. banking on that, inshallah, you know, because Allah knows my many, many faults and failures and many other aspects of my life. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a part of me now. It's part of being a Muslim woman, of being strong and proud of being a Muslim woman and being unapologetic and not trying to just like fit in and not trying to just be like everybody else because we're not like everybody else. We are Muslims. We are believers, <laughs> you know. Allah tells us the believers are the greatest of all creation. So we should be acting like it and not be shy, not be afraid of it. And just, you know, it's. I feel like it's a symbol of strength as well, inshallah. And it's a symbol of just like our Islamic identity. It really is. And not something to be shy about. So I pray that, you know, Allah gives us all true sincerity in our acts of worship, whether it's niqab or anything else that we choose to undertake. Mm -hmm. uh, and that we are able to continue in those acts of worship with that sincerity and that it is a source of ajr for us on the day of judgment, a source of reward for us uh, and helps us get to Jannah, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much, sister, for this time that you've given us today and your beautiful advice and really amazing like things that you've talked about during the discussion. I've really benefited, alhamdulillah. Yeah, thank you so much. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Sister.